Hello, my name is Jason Reichel, and you're listening to Risk Management Brick by Brick. I'm fascinated with people who are helping build and maintain the physical world around us. On each episode of this podcast, we'll dive in with a risk manager, speak to them about how technology plays a role in this process. Hey, Paul, thank you for joining me on Brick by Brick. I'm excited to talk to you about the intersection of technology and construction. What's your current title, Paul? Director of Virtual Construction, and I'm at uh, MJ Harris Construction Services. Great. So virtual construction. Why don't we start with what that is, and then we can kind of work backwards. I I don't know if, you know, when you were a kid, you're like, I want to be in virtual construction or not, but maybe you can tell us how you got there. So I would say virtual construction is, some people will call this virtual design and construction or building information modeling. And really it's probably been about, I've been in it about 20 years for general contractors. And that's about how long in the construction industry that it's really started to gain popularity. So when I was a kid, there really wasn't even a thing called virtual construction. And so, so I would say 13 years, you know, I've been at MJ Harris and prior to that, and we're about a $300 million a year company. And prior to that, I was at um, J. Dunn Construction and prior to that, Holder Construction. And both of those are $5 billion companies. So kind of large GC down to midsize and really started out wanting to be an architect because I worked for an architecture firm um, after school. I'd go and then I worked there throughout getting my associates in architecture full time. And then I went to architecture school at Auburn University and didn't really know a whole lot about uh, the building construction program there. And then once I got to Auburn, I realized it's kind of more what I wanted to do. And then I transferred over to uh, building science. And Auburn's actually the oldest uh, building uh, construction school in the country. And they've got a great program. And they've started to include uh, construction technology and building information modeling into their program over the past uh, several years. And I've been involved kind of advising them what makes sense into what classes and that types of thing. So it's really kind of gone for full circle of not having a whole lot of knowledge about it and not really being offered in education when I was in school to they have classes where they teach that now over there. Yeah, that's amazing to like be at the the birth site of an entire part of the industry, right? Being being brought to life. So if we go all the way back to 1998 and then travel forward, what's something that's happened in the technology space that you really think helped define or leap forward this practice? I think the ability to solve issues and prevent risk, which one, that's one thing you guys are all about is risk prevention, prevent risk before we actually get out there and build the building. So by creating stuff virtually in 3D on the computer where we can figure out all the issues of constructability prior to having duct fabricated or pipe fabricated and uh, dealing with time, material costs, labor costs, and schedule delays, by companies seeing that it, that worked and they were building better products. So my first BIM job was probably around 2005 or so. And, and we really had to prove ourselves in terms of why are we doing this? Why are we spending this time and this money to do this effort? What is the end result to where we're going to actually save the company time and money? But then once we started to do it on the first one and the next one, it, it got better. Yeah, that's kind of one of my main questions when you, so when, when you start first started using BIM, Anytime you're using any kind of emerging technology to do something, you're going to have to prove it. When do you think that, you know, the people around you really grokked and understood the value of putting this into their process and stopped looking at it as an additional cost, but instead something that's actually, you know, maybe competitive or strategic for them to be doing? I think after the first successful job, when they've experienced it, and then they see this project versus a similar project where they didn't use it. When it's happening, it's kind of hard to grasp the value overall when it's happening for the first time for a project team. Uh, But once they're done and they realize how smooth it went versus not, then they're like, yeah, I want that on my next one. And I want that. And they start requesting it. Practically, it makes things safer. It speeds up timelines and it reduces costs, right? I mean, that that's like the hallmark of a really powerful technology uh, ROI, right, within organizations. When now do you decide, do you deploy on every deal you guys do now, or is what's the criteria for you to be, to be brought into a project? Uh, I would say we're 100% BIM on all our projects. Spec requirements, so the specifications of the job may require BIM, but only 
I could only say probably in 13 years at MJ Harris, I've probably only seen it maybe four or five times and done several, you know, hundreds of jobs right now. And, but we still do it, whether it's for contract required or not, because they know it's going to save us time or save us time and money as well as the design team and then bring the owner a better product. I mean, even renovations and things that are a little bit harder to do the building information modeling process on, we'll, we'll still try our best to do it. But capturing data out in the field with laser scanning and some other technologies we use, just because we know it's better than nothing. If we, even if it's a tough job that we may not be able to capture everything, we still want to try. So I think one of the things that people might want to understand about this is the hurdles a company would typically face when trying to put these technologies into place across the various projects. I guess I'm asking, how do you sell this as the value add that it is? You know, I recently had someone on the podcast that does underground scanning, right? And then they go out on the site and they scan above the ground and look below it to see if there's any gas lines. And now when they first started, they had to sell the idea that this was something valuable to do. And now they're getting, you know, inundated with phone calls every day about, hey, can you come do this on our project? Hey, can you come do this on our project? What are some ways that you've seen this be integrated or sold in the proper way? The ability to minimize the process of the owner having to make decisions that that deviate from their original design at the last minute. If we're able to submit these RFIs or anything associated with design not being completely constructible, the earlier we can do that, the, the more time we give the owner to make decisions about things, if it does get to that point. Otherwise, we have guys in the field with material on the ground waiting for a decision and, and, and the clock starts much faster than otherwise noted. So yeah, the more time you got, you know, the same thing with anything, right? The more time, the less risk. So it allows us more time to make decisions. So obviously you're probably integrated into the project schedule, but when, when things like revisions need to come up, how does, how do you interact with the, the project manager on the projects? Do scenario building out? Like if we have do this option, this other option, then where are we going to be? And then that's what's presented to the owner? Or, or what's the relationship that you have with your project managers on site and, and on, on the ground, let's say, after the initial phases of the project have been completed? One thing that we make sure that we do is we incorporate the, the project managers and our superintendents in the process as we do it. So they'll be, we have a coordin weekly coordination meetings and they'll be on the call as well. And we use uh, tools through a uh, software called Procore that integrates all the BIM and everything to where everyone can see it. So we're allowing transparency every day through the BIM process. So if we get siloed and we say this is technology and this is something the technology guys do, then we're too late by the time it gets to the PM and, and the decisions need to be made. So they need to be part of that process and part of the decision making on, yeah, we need to either go to this option or this option. Now, in, in general coordination, the trades are the experts at the routing and they suggest the final routing, but there's things that have to change, sometimes have to change in design where we will provide an option to the design team and we'll all kind of come together and decide what we can do and see and, and present that RFI as a yes or no type of answer for them. In your role, is it similar to how, I mean, because you you definitely have an ownership part of the process, but then you're a partner with the others in the process. You just mentioned the trades and you mentioned your project managers. A lot of times when we talk to risk managers, they talk about how to have a healthy relationship with those other people that they have to work with. What are some of your tactics that you use in order to have a good, you know, workable uh, relationship with everybody on your team? I think setting expectations early and then having, especially with our trade partners, having them give input in terms of how we're going to plan out the entire process of this pre-coordination that we do with uh, BIM and VDC and having them, you know, say, when do you think you can get level one done and, and what's your capacity and, and, and have a working schedule that works for everyone that still meets our overall project schedule. And then, you know, having dialogue and using soft skills, because especially a lot of what we do is virtual. So we're on Zoom a lot and things. And it's 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 kind of hard to come across uh, over the computer as it is if you're sitting there like a superintendent sitting there with the actual installer in the field. Right. That's that's more of like a, a grounded feeling, right? When you're making decisions at that level. A question I have for you on that is. Did you always have that input worked into the process or is this one of the things that over time you found really allows uh, 
the virtual and the real world experience to be tied together? I think over time, and, and part of the way that we're able to do this is through the evolution of project management software. Uh, in the past uh, seven or eight years, the industry has gone, gravitated towards more of a collaborative cloud-based management system where we have our design teams and everyone shared in one system like Procore or other ones that are out there. Um, so that allows us to communicate more, allows us to all see the same thing at the same time, and it's allowed this this process to evolve uh, from what it used to be 20 years ago. Do you have interface with your risk management team directly? Uh, yes. And so what kind of things come up in those conversations when someone's working on with you on this technology and they're in risk? What, what kind of scenarios are you running? How has this technology and the way, what you do it, have impacted risk? It minimizes our risk for a job. So that, and that's why we're doing it on all our jobs. We have trades that are not capable of doing it, but at the same time, from a cost standpoint, we still need to use them. So we will find a way to get it done for them just because we know it's a big deal. And we'll have them from a risk standpoint, if we're, we're having everyone, we have identification agreements that we have to sign off uh, from the design team. And then we have our own agreements that we, sign, that we have all our trades sign off. Because at the end of the day, Contract docs are the contract docs, the drawings that are housed on Procore and that everyone gets, that's the contract. And all this other stuff that we're doing is all supplemental information to support the constructability of the building, which is means and methods, which we're tied to as the GC. So whether it's our legal risk, all those guys, we're all making sure that everybody's indemnified, but we're all still working together as a team to get this done. And the end, end result is a, a constructible building. Some of the document flow, of course, we're, we're submitting shop drawings to the architect and they're able to review those and say, yeah, I accept this. But at the same point, if it's a uh, change to the design intent, uh, we're submitting that as an RFI. So it becomes part of the contract as well, rather than just a submittal. Right. So an amendment to it. Uh, not just making changes. When I think about this, you know, um, some of the stuff you're talking about around lean construction principles and project management in conjunction with technology can you explain how you've used lean construction principles and this technology, like and your technology background to improve things within your organization over the last, you know, 20 years? How have you matched theoretical practices with, you know, very real technology practices? I mean, Le yeah, lean, that's a big something I've been big about as well, you know, ever since I guess 2013. And it's become popular in our industry. Uh, I would say as much as BIM. But the one thing about lean principles versus BIM is Sometimes, a lot of times, you'll have the technology guys also handling lean at other corporations. Sometimes they're separate. But in general, it's all about making sure that we're as efficient as possible with everything, whether it's in technology with file structures and processes and meeting processes. You know, there's a standard process to everything we do, just like there would be a standard process uh, for anything you would do lean-wise or other process-wise out in the fields. We, we treat it the same way. So you treat it as more of a crap. You're always evaluating if what you're doing is the most effective way of doing it. Because I know that a lot of technologists view what, you know, any part of their job, I mean, pro project managers, uh, trade workers, they all view their unique experience over time. And in a lot of ways, it gets less efficient because they want to create a, it's the same thing in risk management. They want to create a catch-all for everything, right? Which leans to not very lean principles, which leads to a lot of bloat and you doing things because you had one experience on a job once, but may not be a continued experience. So I'm always interested in how do you manage the balance between adding steps in, to your process and being as lean as possible to be as cost-effective and efficient as possible with your time. I think uh, one thing that helps us is we have a lot of experts in our company and, and they give us feedback as we go back through and, you know, get done with coordinating a job and say, all right, these are kind of the things that we were looking for on this one. And we do build, we build different things. We build a lot of uh, hospitals. It's a lot of these hospitals are similar. So we have maybe the top five things that we always look for on these types of jobs. And for something to get added to that list, it's not necessarily got to be a one-off thing. Uh, it needs to be something that consistently would be an issue on all these types of jobs. So through just experience of being on so many jobs and coordinating them and also our our leadership here in terms of their experience, that we, we come to a conclusion of what should be included and looked out for. And we include that on a document, but the document's not multiple pages. You know, it's only two pages. And then we 
slash through things that we say, oh, well, that's not a- applicable anymore and and move on. So so you start with a baseline template of, of what you do from a procedural standpoint, and then you modify based on structure or industry uh, and then review that with a common sense approach. Do you do that with just yourself or is it a broader team approach when you're you were going through what things are we going to run on this project particularly? Well, we have kickoff meetings, so internal kickoff meetings, and I'll start with the baseline, and then we'll talk about specifics of the job within our own team and what things we need to look out for. And then those one-offs that may we may need to look out for on this job, that'll get transferred to our trade kickoff meeting that we would have maybe the next week. You're never starting a job without having input from everybody uh, on, on the way it should go, just because, again, you know, 12 minds are better than one. And, and other people, the PM or the project executive or anyone may have a different perspective uh, on different things about the job that's about to start up. One of the things that people don't often talk about about the lean methodology or, or what you just described is it's sort of a bottoms up approach. It starts with the expert and then moves into bringing everyone on board. It really builds a lot of alignment on teams and, and, and really is great for your subcontractors too because they are have a, a role to play in part of that process where a lot of subcontractors feel, you know, in certain organizations like cut out from the creative pro- part of the process or from the practicality part of the process, right? You know, one of the, when I interview people from the trades, you know, a lot of their response to technology is sometimes that it is not what is happening in real life. You know, it's not what's happening when they're on the ground. And so it's really interesting to talk to people who bring people in earlier and make sure that they're involved in the process and, and have their inputs heard. It's one of the things that I really like about whenever I see you post anything or, or talk about one of the things I think you do really well is the inclusionary piece of how to get technology adopted and how to get technology as part of your standardized process versus being some extra thing that you can run. Because of your background, I, what's something that's happening in, in, in your world right now that you're really excited about from a technology standpoint? I think uh, you've probably heard a lot about it, but AI... And um, that's something that, you know, I just had a webinar with ABC this morning, uh, ABC National about AI. And I sat on a few panels, and then I'm also part of the uh, ABC uh, Tech Committee, National Tech Committee. And our recent uh, tech report that's just released uh, is completely about artificial intelligence. So in terms of um, impact on the industry, you know, I've for the construction, I've been in the industry for 25 years and been tech leadership for 20 I can say this will have more of an impact than anything has. And I just went to a conference not too long ago where the uh, CEO of Turner was talking about this as well and and how this will impact our industry as well as all other industries more so than anything in the pa- has in the past 100 years. And this is a guy that's been leading technology at Turner for 30 years, so he's not you know just on the bandwagon. This is something he's really looked at. From your perspective, are you already seeing AI be incorporated into your workflows? And and, and, wh- and where are you using it today? Uh, yes, at, at, a, at a baseline using um, you know, chat GPT for reviewing um, documents and things as far as our policies. We've had some quality things that have been improved through that, through the latest models. Um, and also just answering general questions throughout coordination. We've had questions about mechanical rooms, whether a water softener needs to be in this type of city because of the hardness of the water and be able to look that up instantly. And and I was able to give that information to the engineer while on the meeting in two seconds, and they ran the calculation and said, oh, yeah, AI, AI is right about this. So just day, daily practices, but at the same time, then you have large organizations like Procore coming out with Copilot that are integrating everything with uh, conversations and Copilot to where it's almost like an assistant for everything you do every day, whether it be in the office and in the field. So it's growing a lot. Some construction companies are taking policies against AI that are not allowing organizations to utilize it and other things like that. Do you think that's a mistake for those organizations at that at, at this point in time? Or, or or do you push them to really examine the use cases? Like, where where is your line right now for organizations? You know, it's, it's kind of a hot topic. I think it's somewhat of a mistake. I think there may be there they could have some standards in terms of don't put certain things in AI that we wouldn't want you to email anyway, or we wouldn't want you to share with anyone anyway. So our quality document, we don't care about that, right? I mean, everyone needs to build high quality, so that would be fine. But if you're going to put a contract or you're going to put some sensitive information about someone's um, you know HR background or anything like that, then yeah, those are things you probably don't want to do. And so using a little bit of common sense and maybe putting it on a document and saying, hey, everybody, use AI, but 
don't use it for these things. And maybe if we're going to really use it, let's have an enterprise chat GPT license and, and start from there. But I think blocking it completely, that would, that's definitely a mistake. Uh, you've seen, we've seen recent studies. I think LinkedIn, and, uh, Microsoft came out with one that said when most people were polled, uh, most people are using it. It's a bottom up kind of approach at all these companies. They're using it without their employer's knowledge or minimal knowledge from leadership because leadership is not really grasping it as much as the employee is at this point. Right. Cause at, at gener- I mean, not to say that, that this is a, but generative work often happens at the lowest levels first. Right. And so they're, they're being forced into position, you know? Uh, yeah, I, I have the same take on it. You need to develop smart policies around it. It probably needs to be part of your, not only your information technology, procedures, but also probably your risk management procedures. What do you do if you, you do have things? How can you create a private AI for your internal use for, you know, business, uh, running the business more effectively? You know, I can imagine in a world where all the work that you've done it for your organization is fed into something and so that you are getting, you know, uh, trends and things that you maybe not even are spotting yet based on what's been happening in the last, you know, five jobs versus the 50. I think that AI so far for everyone that I've worked with around it in in the industry, it's finding things faster than your gut experience allows you to cue in. But it's not, at this point in time, just the way it's working, it's not really revolutionizing. It's more organizing to best practices and other things. And I I think that's really useful. I think people should put that into practice within their organizations. But I do think that coming up with a risk management and risk mitigation strategy and and a strong IT process about how to use the tool is probably useful. Construction companies have been not always the fastest to adopt technologies. And, you know, I think the big ones and the ones that have grown over the last 15 years, uh, such as yours, has, but a lot don't. And as you said, sometimes some of the leadership up there is sitting in a position where they might not have the full information about these tools. Um, It really is not the same thing as a hammer, although it's a nice analogy. It's more like replacing the hammer with something that can not only nail things, but also punch holes in walls, right? So you you have to really get your arms wrapped around that. So it it is interesting to talk about. And it's kind of like bringing back to BIM, where you're really having to prove that use case again. But we have something that's going to be far more powerful, and it's it's not going to be in a silo like BIM was for so many years and still is it's in some places. It's going to be everywhere. So um, I think you'll see the proof and the adoption happen much more rapidly than anything we've ever seen before. Let's play risky or too risky. I'm going to give you a rapid fire question. You tell me if it's risky or too risky. You're a technologist. So usually people come on, on who are technologists come on the risky side, not the too risky side, but we'll see. You're invited to speak at an overseas event without any upfront travel reimbursement. Is that risky or too risky? Would you do it? Oh, yeah. Oh, but they're going to reimburse me? Yeah, they say they're going to reimburse you, but, but it's not upfront. Oh, so risky. Risky, right? Yeah. I mean, especially if they're from an accredited event that it's happened multiple years in a row, you might not want to go for the first year one. <laughs> right? I've, I've done an overseas event and they've reimbursed me. I've done that before. It's 2012. <laughs> You're thinking about buying a house in a rapidly developing area that hasn't yet established local amenities or public services. Risky or too risky? Risky. Okay. Last one, you're offered a chance to lead a project that's outside your usual scope of expertise but could lead to significant professional growth. Is that risky or too risky? I bet I can guess the answer. Risky. Yeah, there's probably nothing you can tell. You got to tell me something crazy and then it'll be too risky. (laughs) Building without BIM. Too risky. Don't do that. Too risky. (laughs) (laughs) The level above too risky, whatever that is. My closing question for you today is uh, looking back over your career, the construction industry is an aging population and we want to attract young, smart technologists and project managers and risk managers and all these people into the industry and revitalize it in an interesting way. What's a piece of advice you would give to someone who's just starting their career, just getting out of school right now, out of college, and are thinking about working within the construction industry? I would say the most important thing is to treat your job like you do school and to continuously learn. Actually, I lecture at Auburn. I have a slide. I've been showing the same slide for eight or nine years of every semester I've been lecturing there. But always learn and don't let being busy at work prevent you from learning something that will make you a better builder. Because if you're able to do this and keep an open mind and continuously learn and ask questions and pursue knowledge rather than just going and doing your job, 
then you're in our industry, you're going to advance faster and get higher pay. It's, it's just guaranteed. So the more you do that, the better you'll be. A lot of times students may graduate, say, oh, I'm now I'm done. Now I can go make money. And they kind of shut down. Yeah. And then you have like a five-year slump, right? And that kind of sets you up for either having to try to accelerate later. It's like you kind of take a dip, you know? I think the same thing happens. Not to say this isn't a good thing. People should have kids, but it's kind of the same thing. Like I always tell people, if you have a kid, the first three years, you're like, just focus on keeping them alive. And then you wake up in a fog and be like, whoa, I'm a person, you know? Yeah. What happened? (laughs) (laughs) What happened? I got to take care of myself. What's a tip that you use to stay continuously curious and, and interested and wanting to learn? How, how do you motivate yourself to do that? Really just talking to my peers and, and other directors at other companies and seeing what they're doing and staying interested in what other companies are accomplishing and testing and saying, oh, well, that's pretty cool. Maybe I should try that. And making it, treating it more like uh, interest, which it is for most technologists, than just a job. And the cool thing about us is our job changes every day, especially with AI now. And you know, I never thought I'd be talking about AI 20 years ago or laser scanning or drones and 360 photos and all this other stuff we do. But it's good that we're able to do this and help other people in our company and, and help them become better builders. So I'm glad I'm able to do this. Paul, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate everything you've done to contribute to the built world, both digitally and physically. And I had a great time talking about your experience. I think it's really helpful to talk to people who were at the emergence of a piece of technology coming into market and talking about how that really constructively revolutionized it. I don't want AI to be this thing that's all apocalyptic, right? I want it to be a tool that we utilize to build the world better. And I appreciate the fight that you have and and, and what you're doing. Thank you. I'm glad I was able to attend today. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Paul. And I'll see you at the next event. Bye, my friend. All right. Thank you. Risk Management Brick by Brick is brought to you by TrustLayer. Find out how TrustLayer manages risk so that the people can build the physical world around us. Head over to TrustLayer.io. And then make sure to subscribe to Risk Management Brick by Brick on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. On behalf of the TrustLayer team, thank you for listening.